Tonight, guys, lesson two for School of Ministry. We're going to dive in and take a look at personal Bible study. Uh, first of all, uh, the homework from last week as we considered uh, prayer together. Uh, I asked you guys to go through the prayers of Paul, and it was so cool because as you guys emailed in the two that really resonated with you, and some of you shared why, it was really, really cool to hear all the different ones because there wasn't a lot of the same. Everybody had different scriptures, but there was one scripture that was a common thread with a lot of you, okay, and it was Ephesians chapter 3, verse 14 and on, and I thought it would be great tonight if we would just take a moment to read and pray this as we start our second lesson for the School of Ministry. It says this, For this reason I bow my knees to the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, from whom the whole family in heaven and earth is named, that he would grant you according to the riches of his glory to be strengthened with might through his spirit in the inner man, that Christ may dwell in your hearts through faith, that you, being rooted and grounded in love, may be able to comprehend with all the saints what is the width and the length and depth and height, to know the love of Christ which passes knowledge, that you may be filled with all the fullness of God. And now to him who is able to do exceedingly, abundantly, above all we could ask or think, according to the power that works in us, to him be glory in the church by Christ Jesus to all generations forever and ever. Amen. So I can see why that prayer resonates with us as believers. Let me tell you what, guys. If you Just check this out once again where it says to know the love of Christ, to actually pray that. Do you guys understand? We can't comprehend fully the love of God, for God is love. But to pray, God, open my eyes. Open my understanding to your love. To know the love of Christ, which passes knowledge, that you may be filled with all the fullness of God. To know, You guys understand that word know is an intimate word? To actually know him in such a way, in such a depth. And that's the beauty of prayer as we considered. And tonight I'm so excited to consider with you the importance of personal Bible study. Because prayer is talking to God and as we get into his word, this is God speaking to us. And there is nothing better, my brothers and sisters. So as we consider the school of ministry. Again, the emphasis is we want to be disciples who are making disciples, right? Disciples making disciples. And my question for you is this. Who's discipling you? Do you have someone? If so, that's great. If not, you need to find someone. The second question is, who are you discipling? And that comes around what I like to call the Paul and Timothy reality of discipleship. Do you guys know that Paul was a man who was pouring into young Timothy? Paul was like a father, spiritually speaking, for young Timothy. And we need Pauls in our life who are speaking into our lives, discipling us. But we also need Timothys at the same time. And that's why you guys are to take two sheets every time you come. Because as we learn, we want to go and make disciples also. I don't know who that is. It might be one of your kids. It might be a neighbor. It might be a coworker. But you want to be pouring into other people. And one of those things, you guys can jot down John chapter 8, verse 31 and 32. Jesus said to the Jews in that day, he said, if you abide in my words... You are my disciples indeed. So there's an important for us to learn the word of God, to hear his word and be able then to teach others. And then he goes on to say right after that, and then you're going to know the truth, 
and the truth is going to set you free. I think that's pretty cool. Because whether people realize it or not, they're in bondage if they don't have Christ in their life. If they've not been set free from their sin, they're living in the dark. They don't know the truth, and they are not free. But we who have come to Christ are the freest people upon this planet. And that's one of the beauties of getting into the scriptures, isn't it? Because the reality of who God is and what he has done for us, the freedom to be found in him, there's nothing like it, guys. And how can we not want to get into his word to learn more? So milk. How many of you guys enjoy milk? I enjoy milk a lot. Um, my parents growing up used to buy a gallon or two a day. We drink a lot of milk growing up. I still enjoy milk. I can't drink as much as I want anymore. I'd be uh, bigger. So... <laughs> Check this out. 1 Peter 2.2, 2, you guys know the scripture. It says, as newborn babes desire the pure milk of what? The word that you may grow thereby. That's why you're here tonight. That's why you guys watching remotely are taking in this class, this course, the school of ministry. Because we know that there is more that God has for us. That he wants us to grow. And the beauty is we get to grow as much as we want in Christ. It's not something God says you're growing too fast, slow down, okay? No, we can grow in him. We can mature, and we need to be taking in the word of God on a regular basis. So, as newborn babes desire the pure milk of the word that you may grow thereby. And the next verse actually says, if indeed you've tasted that the Lord is gracious, How many of you guys can say amen to that? I have tasted and seen that the Lord is good and his grace does abound towards me. There is grace upon grace. And the thing that's cool with Peter, at the end of his first epistle here, you can jot down chapter 3, verse 18. The last thing that he says in his letter is that we should continue to grow in the grace, in the knowledge of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Also jot down Hebrews chapter 10, verse 7. Then Jesus, this is referring to Jesus, but he he says, Behold, I have come in the volume of the book, the volume of it, all 66 of the books that are in this one book, the greatest book of all time, is about him, he tells us. Colossians 3.16, Let the word of Christ dwell in you richly. That's an exhortation. Well, how can we let God's word actually dwell in us if we're not actually in it, receiving it ourselves? So we are told to let it dwell in us. You can jot down 1 Thessalonians 2.13, that the word of God, it tells us that it effectively works in those who believe. How many of you guys, when you came to Christ, you tried maybe reading the Bible before, but you came to faith. You said yes to him. And then you read his word, and it was radically different than it ever was before, right? Your spiritual eyes were opened because the word of God effectively works in those who believe. And one of my favorite scriptures is Romans chapter 10, verse 17. Faith comes by hearing, and hearing by the word of God. A lot of people say God just gives us faith. Well, God says, I don't care what people say, God says that faith comes by his word, hearing his word. That's why it's so important that we're taking in the word of God. But not just for ourselves, but again, we're to go and share that with other people. To share the good news, the word of God with a world that desperately (laughs) desperately needs to hear it. And one of my favorite scriptures is Hebrews chapter 11, verse 6. But without faith, it's impossible to please God. But he who comes to God must believe that he is and that he is a rewarder of those who diligently seek him. Think about that, guys. God will reward those who diligently seek him. Another part of your homework from last time was to memorize what? 2 Timothy 2.15. Study to show yourselves approved to God. A workman that doesn't need to be ashamed. 
rightly dividing the word of truth. Some of you guys might have a different translation where it says to be diligent to study. But that's on us. And God says when we diligently seek him, if we come to him with faith, he's going to be pleased. And if we diligently seek him, Hebrews 11.6, he will reward us for that. So how can we not want to give ourselves to personal Bible study? Amen? You guys ready to jump in? All right. We're going to start with a quote from this guy. His name's Landon Churchill. He says this, personal Bible study brings a personal holy fear of God, which leads to a joyful, God-glorifying life that leaves holy legacy. I believe that with all my heart, guys. And I know I don't enter into a life of always glorifying God, a life that is always rejoicing in my Savior. And I can tell you what's normally going on. There's a disconnect in my personal Bible time. You can go back and track. Oh, I haven't been in the Word. I haven't been hearing from the Lord. I wish God would just speak to me. Have you ever had anybody say that to you? Or maybe you've said that. You know what a person needs to do to have God speak to them? Open his word. <laughs> he is going to speak. And sometimes we get so caught up in, hey, did you hear what so-and-so said? Did you catch that on the news? Did you read them? Did you hear what God had to say? What he thinks? Because let me tell you what, people have opinions, and I'm all for opinions. It's great. You have right to have opinions. Doesn't mean your opinion's going to be right, but <laughs> you have a right to have your opinions. But one thing I've found in my life, guys, God is always right. His opinion is actually the one that really matters and really only matters. So at the end of the day, what does God say? And that's really the question. If we have not read, how are we going to know? That's why personal Bible study is so important. So, yeah, boom, the word of God. Did you guys know that Satan hates you and God loves you? Oh, thanks, Captain. Obvious. That Satan hates you. And he hates that you are ministering in Jesus' name. He hates that. You guys can jot down Luke 10, 19. Behold, I give you authority to trample on serpents and scorpions. Hey, that's cool. And over all the power of the enemy, and nothing shall by any means hurt you. I think that's pretty cool. And then we also know that God loves us. And that's one thing you are going to read as you read his word. That is what God wants to reveal to us in a radical way. Even as we consider the scriptures as a whole, we have the Old Testament. And no one ever once in the Old Testament tells God that they love him. The only love that we hear about is how God loves us. And then the New Testament, which was written in Greek, they didn't even have a word for that type of love. God love. Agape was something they had to come up with just to explain God's love. I think that's pretty cool, guys. You guys can jot down Joshua 1.8. The book of the law, it shall not depart from your mouth, but you shall meditate in it day and night. And you may observe to do all according to what is written in it. For you will make your way prosperous, and then you will have good success. Do you guys know that God wants you to be successful. He wants you to be prosperous. He wants your ministry to thrive. That is a reality. Well, how does that happen? How do we know that? What does that look like? Well, read his word. See what he has to say about that because he tells us how that works. And to meditate, that word there, in Joshua 1.8, to meditate on your word day and night. That's literally to chew. Chew the cud. 
Take in the word of God. Meditate on it. Chew on it. Because a lot of times it's just like, all right, that's a cool scripture. On to something else. On to what's next. No. (laughs) Allow yourself to chew on the word of God. And kind of like a cow will chew something, enjoy it. It goes down into the stomach. They bring it back up again. Chewing the cud. Chew on it some more. How often do we miss something because we're forgetful or we haven't given time to it to really work in us, to really work it out? How does this look? What does it actually mean? How does it apply to my life? And that's why it's good to meditate upon God's word. And there is promised success given. So I'm going to have Phineas read to us Proverbs chapter 3, verses 1 through 10. Listen carefully. My son, do not forget my teaching, but let your heart keep my commandments for the length of the days and years of my of life, and the peace they will add to you. Let not steadfast love and faithfulness forsake you. Bind them around your neck, write them on the tablet of your heart, so you will find favor and good success in the sight of God and man. Trust the Lord with all your heart and do not lean on your own understanding. In all your ways acknowledge him and he will make your make straight your paths. Be wise, be not wise in your own eyes. Fear the Lord and turn away from evil. It will be healing to your flesh, refreshment to your bones. Honor the Lord with wealth and first fruits of all your produce. Then your barns will be filled with plenty and your and your vats will be bursting with wine. Thanks. Praise the Lord. All right, I listened to that a few times in preparation. And it just blessed my heart in a total different way, guys. My encouragement was going to be, it doesn't matter how old you are, how long you've been in the Lord. It is good to trust in him, not to lead on your own understanding. But there are benefits to trusting God, taking in his word. But as I just listened to my son, this is young Finn. My father's heart was really blessed. Here's my son reading the word of God. And I thought, man, how blessed must our heavenly father be when we as his kids just read his word. Man, that's got to bless his heart big time, guys. You're delighting in me. You care about what I say. Yeah. There's benefits to us being in personal Bible study. But I think there's so much more to it than we understand, guys. We need to fear the Lord. This was confirmed this morning in my Thursday morning Bible study that I've been doing for over 17 years now. Group of men every week. A few of you here this morning were there. And we're just working through the whole Bible verse by verse. We're in the Gospel of John right now. And John's just super sweet every time we get into it. But there was something God did this morning that God just came around us being in awe, like a true reverence, a true fear of who God is just from being in his word together this morning. It was very sobering, and I was blessed by it because it confirmed what God had been putting on my heart in preparation for tonight. The fear of the Lord. You guys know that in the scriptures we often say, hey, there's 365 times it's told to us to fear not. We've all heard that. That's cool. But do you guys know that there's over 200 times in the Bible where we're told to fear God? It's pretty important that we understand this and get that. To walk as a believer in the holy fear of God in reverence of who he is, because he is holy, holy, holy. God is completely other, guys. And to have that type of reverence for him. 
And when we have right reverence for him, you guys think you're going to listen and hear his word a little differently? It's not just like, oh, so-and-so is here speaking to me. Who cares? No, this is God Almighty. And I wish as believers, as the church, we would even take that a little more serious than we actually do. Say, hey, I have a guest speaker coming tonight. Michael Jordan, my favorite athlete of all time, is going to come to Kokano, Wisconsin, and he's going to speak. I don't think we'd have enough chairs here for everybody that would show up to hear Michael Jordan. We have the word of the living God. And people have other priorities. Many reasons why not to come and to hear the Lord. And I think it's because we lack reverence. We don't have a right awe, a right fear of God. And I think that's why God speaks so much in his word to the fear of God. You see, people love Jesus, but they don't fear God. Meditate on that for a little while. Chew on that reality. We're exhorted in Scripture to be holy as he is holy. Well, how does that work? What does that look like? How are you holy, God? Well, he's revealed himself to us. He has told us how he is completely other, how he is set apart, how he is above all other gods, how he is holy. Cleanse yourselves, we're told in Scripture, right? 2 Corinthians 7.1, Therefore, having these promises, beloved, let us cleanse ourselves from all filthiness of the flesh and spirit, perfecting holiness in the fear of God. Does God want us to be cleansed, to be holy? He's made that very clear in Scripture. Well, isn't it Jesus that does that all? Yeah, he's done it, but the Scripture tells us to cleanse ourselves We better do that. And if God says the key is to have a godly fear, well, that's what it's going to take. So grasping that and growing in that, and I want to encourage you, my brothers and sisters, pay attention in your personal Bible study to the fear of God. Let it teach you. It's there for a reason. Isaiah chapter 66, verse 1, Thus says the Lord, Heaven is my throne and earth is my footstool. Where is the house that you will build for me? And where is the place of my rest? Do you guys know that apart from God's grace, we can do nothing? We can't build nothing. We can't accomplish nothing. And sometimes it's really easy for us as believers to be selective in our obedience. Do you guys know what I'm talking about? Oh, this area of my life? Oh, yeah, you got that, God. I can do that. But this over here, not yet. Not now. Let that not be so, guys. And to think that we can build ministry apart from him, we can't. The second part of what Isaiah tells us in verse 2, he says, For all those things my hands have made and all those things they exist, says the Lord. But catch this, he says, But on this one will I look, on him who is poor, and of him who is contrite spirit, and who trembles at my word. Can we be trembling at God's word if we don't have personal Bible study? How are you going to tremble? Daily Bible study is important, guys. It is good for you and I to be in the word of God, to see that he is holy, that he is right, to fear him rightly. Because if you check in daily, is that going to maybe set the stage for the day? May it make paths maybe straight in what God is calling you to, what his will may be, the purpose that he would have for you that day? Absolutely. There's sometimes, guys, it's just like, man, (laughs) why didn't I read that sooner or actually study that sooner, pay more attention to that? Why is the fear of God, for instance, something that I haven't really even chewed on and thought about? Why is that so important? Because we like the loving part of God. 
We love to sing songs about his faithfulness, faithfulness, faithfulness. And his goodness, goodness, goodness. But holy, holy, holy? Oh, I don't know if I like singing that. Because that gives me some perspective. Shows me who he is and who I'm not. Showing me that he's in charge and he's on the throne. And what he's asking of me. I got to take that serious. Hebrews 4.13, and there is no creature hidden from his sight, but all things are naked and open from the eyes of him who must give account. Or you might be able to pull things over on others, maybe even your spouse, but you know what? God sees it all. It's all laid bare before him. He knows. And maybe you even have things together, outwardly speaking. Guess who sees the heart, sees the pride, sees the issues, the sin. It's God. We can't hide from him. And that's why love, that was Hebrews 4.13, and then James 1.22. It tells us to be doers of the word and not hearers only. A lot of people can know scripture. It's a whole other thing to actually do scripture, isn't it? And what happens when we don't do it? We deceive ourselves. Oh, I'm good. I know the word of God. That's why I don't have to go to church anymore or be in a Bible study or a fellowship. Even though I know Hebrews 10.25 says, do not forsake the assembling together. This is the manner of some because of the deceitfulness of sin. Okay? We come up with our excuses. I know the word, but I'm not willing to do it. And as a result, I'm deceiving myself. Now, I want to give you guys a big tip when it comes to Bible study. Have a personal, physical Bible in hand. There's something to that. I'm not against a smartphone or tablet, okay? Those are tools that can be used. But there's benefits to having a Bible in hand. For one, I love taking notes. Okay, I, if I'm on my smartphone, I can highlight stuff there and mark it, but I don't write notes in it. It might have the option to, but I really don't. But if I have my physical Bible, I'm highlighting stuff, underlining, taking little notes. And it's cool because I can go back. Oh, God spoke that to me. And this is how I prayed about that scripture. Or this is how I wanted to apply it. Or this is what he put on my heart as I read it, and being able to go back to it's beautiful. And one of the biggest things about having a physical Bible is context, okay? I like utilizing PowerPoint. Isn't it nice for you guys to see scriptures just up there? Like, oh, that's helpful, okay? But if you don't have a physical Bible in hand, it's hard sometimes to catch the context because as I'm flipping over to this book to check this out, I'm like, oh, yeah, That happened right before that. That's the context. That makes so much more sense. And there's a safety in that. I remember when I was back in between Bible college years, I had a a summer back home here, and I was going to this church and that church. I was a church junkie, taking in the word as much as possible. But the church that I was a part of, that I was serving at, They were a church that was very topical in nature, that a couple scriptures would be thrown out on a Sunday morning, and then the pastor would talk around that scripture, and it would be inspirational, and everybody would feel good about whatever they're feeling good about. And a scripture was thrown up there, and the pastor began to teach on it. And I'm sitting there with my Bible in hand, and I'm looking around. There's not a whole lot of other people that actually had physical Bibles with them that morning pastor as he was preaching on the scripture was preaching it out of context he was saying something about it that didn't mean what he was saying because if you knew the context of it it was something totally different than what he was making it to say and there's a safety guys when we have the word of God and we're able to have the context of scripture so I want to encourage you guys in our personal bible study you just don't go flipping here and there like oh Here's another promised scripture for me. Oh, this is good. Oh, I just hang in the New Testament. Because we know what the Old Testament is like. No, it's all needed. It all speaks of Jesus. We need it all. 
So I want to encourage you guys. There's something about having the word of God in hand. And there's also something about when you're discipling somebody, okay, you have them read. There's a few guys that I meet with, and I will literally, hey, read this for yourself. And there is something about having a physical, like, oh, this is a Bible. (laughs) This is the word of God, and I'm going to read this myself. I had a man a few years back, probably about eight years now, um, he's, he just said to me, hey, um, it's the first time I met him, too. He's like, I, I haven't told anybody, really, and I, I don't know why, but I feel like I need to tell you this. And he just shared with me that he's a homosexual. And he's like, and I've had people say this that are Christians, and I don't know. <laughs> you know what I told him? Nothing. I had my Bible with me, and I opened to Romans chapter 1. I just gave it to him. I'm like, can you just read this out loud? And as he read just the word of God, this man broke and began to weep. Just the word of God. And the questions that he had, the misinformation from other Christians who told him that that is okay in the eyes of God, understood what God actually said. And there's something, guys, when we just read the word of God, because our thinking can get really messed up. In our religion, in the people we follow, they may be messed up. And we're saying, hey, they teach the Bible. That's what it says. No, personal Bible study. Read it for yourself. What does God actually say? And it's important, guys, that we're taking in the word. Verse 27 up here. It says, I charge you by the Lord that this epistle be read to all the holy brethren. God wants his word shared with all. This is something that he tells us to do. We need to be sharing the word of God. So when we disciple, it's not getting together and enjoying coffee. No, get together. Consider what God has to say, what he has declared. Teach others what he says. And I want to encourage you too, we get to feast on the word of God. It is a a blessing. But you guys who know me well know that I like physical food. And I like my physical food hot. You guys know what I'm talking about? Like it comes out of the oven. It's like, hey, eat now. It is hot. It is yummy. It is fresh. A few weeks back, I was convicted because I really like my food hot. But I want to have a greater hunger for the word of God. I want it to have a place in my life. So my family, we've been before we eat. The food will be out, just sitting there, being ready to be consumed. We'll stop. And we've been taking turns reading different passages of Scripture. And I think it's for me more than anyone. But just to say, hey, man shall not live on bread alone, but every word that proceeds from the mouth of God, Matthew 4, 4. This is what's important. Even more than me enjoying my food super hot. Even if that means I have to eat it cooled down and a little cold. I want to be reminded that, hey, the word of God is what I need. Above this food, physical food. You can jot down Amos chapter 8, verse 11 and 12. I'm going to read it to you. The prophet says this, Behold, the days are coming, says the Lord, that I will send a famine on the land. Not a famine of bread, nor of thirst for water, but the hearing of the words of the Lord. They shall wander from sea to sea and from north to east. They shall run to and fro, seeking the word of the Lord, but shall not find it. And I would say that's the case today. I share the gospel with people when I can, and I don't know how many people over the years have told me, I've never heard this before. How have you never heard this before? How many churches are just in this valley? We have over 200 churches in the valley. We're a Christian nation. This is the best-selling book of all time. But there's a famine for the word today in the land. Most Christians, they won't even read the word of God. Oh, you can walk into their house and you can find all their Christian books they've bought. You can go to their fellowship 
groups, life groups, and there's so many today, they're not actually studying the Bible together. What are they doing? They're walking through the newest Christian book that's out. That's the reality of the church today. And even some of you, and I've had many over the years say, hey, I'm so glad that we found this church. We've been looking for a church that would just teach the Bible. It's a bummer. That should be every church, in my opinion, because that's what God has told us in his word we t- were to do. But it's sad. And even Bible teaching churches today, I go there because they're a Bible teaching church, but I'm hearing about politics. And I'm hearing about all the things that we're against as Christians rather than hearing about Christ because the volume of the book's about him. And it's so easy, guys, for us to get to a place where there's a famine for the word of God just to be simply taught. What does it say? What does it say? Not what do I want to talk about and make it say. What does it just say? Hosea 4, 6. My people are destroyed for a lack of knowledge because they have rejected knowledge. Is God trying to hide himself from us? No. And what a blessing that we have and the freedoms we have even to have a Bible. We have brothers and sisters in this world, if they were caught with this book, they could be thrown in jail for that or maybe even killed in some countries. We have great freedom. Everybody owns a Bible. (laughs) But do we actually read it? We're destroyed because of lack of knowledge. Well, I don't know what the Word says. And again, there's a lot of people who love Jesus, but they're ashamed of His Word because they don't know it. They're destroyed because of lack of knowledge. Study to show yourselves approved to God. A workman that doesn't need to be ashamed. And that's the thing. There are so many brothers and sisters who deeply love the Lord, but they're embarrassed by the word of God because they don't know, they haven't studied that their friend or co-worker begins to question their faith and they're not able to give a defense. Why is the world so messed up? Why is there so much suffering? Well, if you haven't read the scriptures, you're not going to have an understanding of those things. You're not going to be able to give those answers. So people are destroyed because they lack knowledge. And knowledge is fundamental for us as believers. God's not trying to hide things. He wants us to be in the know. He actually invites us, right? Isaiah chapter 1, verse 17. Come, let us reason together, says the Lord. He wants to reason with us. But are we going to make that a priority? I hope so. And I hope it's not a, I have to, but I get to. I get to be in the know. I get to hear from God Almighty. I get to study his word. So we got to be in his word. It's important to think about thinking, to have right thinking. I don't know about you guys, but there's so many times in my Bible study, it's just like, whoa, my thinking's really wrong. (laughs) Sorry, God, because you're right. And we need to have that. So we need to align ourselves according to God's word. And that's what we're going to be doing in the next few times we get together is inductive Bible study. How do we rightly divide the word inductively? What does God say and how do we fit our lives into what he says? Because today, a lot of preaching from the word of God, a lot of the books that we're reading as Christians that are coming out from the church today, It's a deductive approach. How am I going to fit my wants? How am I going to make God fit into what I desire? That's a deductive approach, and it's dangerous. And churches find themselves, that's all they're peddling, is, hey, we want you to feel good. We're going to talk about the love of God all the time. We're going to talk about finances and blessings and family because we need to focus on the family because that's what it's all about. No, the Bible says focus on Jesus. And that's what's going to happen when you inductively approach his word. And you're going to say, yes, God, (laughs) you're right. You say this. I need to align my life, my thinking according to your word. Amen? You guys tracking with me? I'm not trying to come down hard. I'm just trying to enlighten our eyes to say, hey, it's important for us 
to read the scriptures. It's important for us to get it right because God is right. And if we're not going to get it right, we're not going to be able to give it right. If I'm not discipled correctly, if I'm not obeying the commands of God, how am I going to be able then to share that with others, to teach others? Romans 12, 1 and 2 says, I beseech you, therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, Paul is saying, I'm begging you guys that you present your bodies as a living sacrifice, holy, acceptable to God, which is your reasonable service. This is reasonable for us as believers. And then in verse 2, he says, don't be conformed to the world. You guys know the world's trying to put us into its mold, saying you have to be this way. But God says, be transformed. And how do we do that? By the renewing of our minds, that you may prove what is the good and acceptable and perfect will of God. And again, I'm believing that's why you guys are taking this course, doing the school of ministry. You want to know what God has, what his will is, to be truly transformed. And I don't want to be like the church that really is running after the world. We're to be totally set apart. We're to be different. I grew up on cartoons. I feel so bad for kids today. They don't have Saturday morning cartoons. That's what I lived for. But one of my favorite cartoons growing up, anybody want to guess what it was? Man, you guys are smart. Transformers. Anybody know who this is? Optimus Prime, right? Now, Optimus can also be a semi-truck kind of boring and that's kind of how I see Christians who are just rolling with the world who are being conformed they're not being transformed they're not engaging they're not thinking they're not allowing God to transform them they're not taking God's word seriously they're like trucking along with the rest of the world that's what they're doing they're not standing out they're not different but God wants us to be transformed like a gnarly, like, optimist, okay? Loaded with guns and weapons, ready to do battle. That's what God wants for you and I, guys. He wants us to be transformed. And I don't know about you, but I want to engage. There's a very real battle going on today. And God's calling us to engage. And the warfare that we're fighting, guys... We're not going to understand it. We're not going to be able to engage and have any impact if we don't understand what God has to say about it. Because the weapons of this warfare, they're not carnal. They're not fleshy. They're not of worldly understanding. It's totally other. So I want to encourage you guys, allow God to renew your mind and do it daily. I think about the stuff that we take in. I mean, how much we are influenced today. I mean, the reality of these smartphones in our hand to be in the know of everything going on in the world, God has not created us to know everything. He alone can handle that. I don't think we're wired to handle the way life is today. But he wants to renew our minds, have us set our minds on those things above where he is seated. And that's why John 17, 17 is so important. Some of you guys seen me carry this around for many, many years, my Bible holster. I've actually had people pull, pull me over and ask, hey, is there a gun in there? No. <laughs> There's another weapon in there. It's the word of God. <laughs> um, but I got two scriptures on there, and one of them is John 17, 17, sanctify them in truth. Be set apart in truth. How do we do that? Well, your word is truth, Jesus tells us. That's how we're sanctified, brothers and sisters. It's in his word. But that's boring. It's not about me. That's why I don't like your preaching, pastor. You're always talking about God. You're preaching the Bible. I want to hear about me. Be sanctified in the truth, guys. It is about him. And again, John 8, 32, you shall know the truth, and truth shall set you free. It's going to set you free from yourself. And this is key. 2 Timothy 3.16, all scripture is given by inspiration of God and is profitable for doctrine, for reproof, for correction, and instructions in righteousness. All scriptures, guys, all 66 books 
all 32,175 verses, all 810,697 words, all 3,566,480 letters are God breathed. All of them. I don't believe you. Don't take my word for it. God says all scripture is God breathed. You guys see how cool that is? And it is profitable for doctrine. It tells us what is right for reproof or rebuke, what is not right for correction, how to get right, and then instructions in righteousness, how to stay right. And why do we do that, guys? Because he's worthy. Guys, you can tell people the truth. You can share God's word with them, but you can't make them think. You can't make them think. I wish I could just shake people. Why don't you get it? There is no God. I believe in science. I believe in science too. It all points towards a creator. Look, observe for two seconds. Duh. Anyway, sorry. I wish I could shake people up. I wish I could make them think. But you can't. You can't make them study. They have to study for themselves. And as we disciple others, guys, we can lead them to the water of life. But they have to partake themselves. Trusting, believing. You guys know the Jews don't even use the word believe. It's trust. The scriptures, they read it in the Hebrew. We might translate it as believe, but they read it as trust. And that's what happens, guys, when we do believe. If we truly believe, we are going to trust and obey the Lord. The next verse there in 2 Timothy 3, 16, goes on to say, that the man of God may be complete, thoroughly equipped for every good work. How many of you guys want to be thoroughly equipped? I sure do. When things come along, every good work, I want to be ready for that. According to God and his word, he says that his word is going to make that possible. It's going to make that doable. And that's what I want to see for you, my brothers and sisters. I want us to be ready for every good work. And that's why I'm encouraging you guys tonight Prayer is the key to ministry. (laughs) But prayer and the word of God, they go hand in hand, don't they? We need both. And that's why I encourage you guys, you need to be praying every day. You need to be in God's word every day. But pastor, I'm reading a really good book right now. It's not as good as this book, (laughs) okay? (laughs) Every day, we need it. So the Bible may hurt you with truth, you with a lie. Is my mic cutting out? Bummer. All right. Let's do the woohoo. Sorry. Can we turn the other one off? There we go. All right. <clears throat> the Bible may hurt you with truth, but it will never comfort you with a lie. I like that statement. Do you guys know that the word of the Lord is referred to as the sword of the Spirit. You guys ever read that somewhere? Maybe in Ephesians, maybe in chapter 6, maybe in verse 17. All right, so the sword of the Spirit. What's really cool when you consider the armor of God, guys, every single one of those pieces of the armor is all protective except for one of the pieces, and that is what? The sword of the Spirit, which is the Word of God. This is King David's sword, okay? It's got the menorah on there, the Star of David, pretty darn cool. But I think it's important for you and I to realize that God's word is meant to cut. And it's going to hurt. The truth hurts sometimes. And we like to believe lies, don't we? Because a lie, uh, don't tell them the truth, that's going to hurt them. No, we speak the truth in love, guys. 
that's the loving thing to do, and God loves us enough to speak the truth. So the sword is a very important thing when it comes to the reality of God's word. I think of Hebrews chapter 4, verse 12. It says, For the word of God is living and powerful. It's sharper than any two-edged sword, piercing even the division of soul and spirit, of joints and marrow, and is the discerner of the thoughts and the intents of the heart. Isn't that pretty cool to think about? That what's going on, God's word, is this double-edged sword that can actually come in and bring right thinking from the wrong thinking. It can divide that. And even the intents of our heart that can get jacked up, God's word can come and bring clarity to our hearts. And heart issues, man, the Bible says they're deep. They go deep. And out of them spring the issues of life. Well, I got a lot of issues. What's going on? Why can't I figure out all these issues? Get into the word of God. It will bring clarity to that. So as we wrap things up tonight, I want to give you guys a few keys to personal Bible study. The first one is establish daily reading. Make it a habit. Take it in whenever you can, however you can. But if you don't schedule it, it ain't going to happen. Okay, And try to do it um, when you're distraction-free. Okay, And having a reading plan is huge. I'm going to recommend to you guys a five-year reading plan. You can download the PDF on our school and ministry site. It's on the website there. Um, the plan is arranged more chronologically, but not slavishly that you get all the gospels mixed up, you know, or you're flipping back and forth between Kings and Chronicles. It's laid out in such a way, guys, um, that it's going to be easy to read. And you also, when you get into the gospels, are going to be able to go through Psalms and Proverbs again over five years. And some of you guys might be like, hey, I like the year-long plan. That's great. Sunny does that all the time, and she's got different Bibles from over the years, and they're all highlighted, and she's got little prayers and notes in there. That's cool. That's a good discipline. But I think it's hard to study the Word of God at that pace, to really give it the time that it's due. And I would encourage you guys, take five years and slowly walk through the Word of God in actually taking time to study it. Well, I don't know how to study the Word of God. <laughs> That's going to be our next three lessons. So another tip I want to give you guys is guard your time. Make the time and then guard the time. Interruption-free. What does that mean? Turn your phone off, okay? I don't know. My phone's not even dinging me notifications, and I'm grabbing it to look for notifications. That's how distracting it is for me. Okay? It's hard for me to study when my family's around. I love my family. I love when they're around. But I do almost all of my Bible reading when they're not around. Distraction-free. Okay? Just whatever you can do. And again, discipline. If you are my disciples, abide in my word, right? Um, also, do some New Testament and Old Testament. Okay? I know some believers, all they'll do is read the New Testament. That's all. They're mis I can honestly tell you I enjoy the Old Testament more. There's so much there, guys. It is so good. I shared this morning at study. I mean, I was something I was blown away. I never saw that before. Do you guys know the, the, the cow, the golden calf that they had made as an idol when Moses was gone, hearing from God? They actually referred to that idol is Yahweh. I had never caught that before. And there is so much more implication there in the Old Testament. I'm always catching new stuff. It's just like, you know what? There's more to that story. I want to dig in and understand why. But just reading it, I'm not going to get it, guys. I got to put the work in and actually study it. So when God begins to show you things in Scripture, take the time to dig in. But if you're just flying through in a year, I got to keep moving. <laughs> no, take five years. Take the time to work through the scriptures. And also add in Psalms and Proverbs. I try to read a little Psalms every day. Proverbs is a go-to. Um, really good for you. A few Bible tips. 
wide margin Bibles. I love them. I asked for this Bible years ago, and what I love about it is it's got wide margins, so I can write things in the side of it. Um, really nice to have. Um, subheadings in Bibles, um, not always helpful. You guys probably have those in your Bibles. Sometimes they're bias. Don't read that as, hey, this is what it's actually about, <laughs> okay? Read the word for itself. Let the word speak for itself. I love cross-references. There's Bibles that have some really good ones. Sometimes they're just cross-referencing words, and you miss a lot, and that's why it's good to dig in. Concordances are helpful. Uh, topical indexes in Bibles are cool. A quality Bible is huge. Uh, just last week, I had to retape. This thing keeps falling apart in the bindings. Get yourself a good Bible that's not going to fall apart on you. Um, I love maps. You guys ever find those helpful in your Bibles? Just like, hey, where are they talking about? Oh, I have maps in the back of my Bible. Let me go and look. And just seeing how it all plays out is so helpful uh, when you're studying. Uh, some other things that can help are dictionaries. Like I got a Vines dictionary here. It goes through because sometimes Bible words, propitiation. What does that mean? <laughs> well, if you got a good Bible dictionary, you can just look up those words. Hey, what is the biblical definition? Because even language changes after time. But what does it mean? What is the Bible actually saying by using that word? Um, there's a lot of good commentaries out there. And again, commentators, they're just man trying to interpret what God has said. Now, some men do it really well, and some are just horrible. And I would encourage you never to touch one of their commentaries. Some commentators hit it out of the park, like Kent Hughes. His commentary on the book of Hebrews was way better than any of his other commentaries. It's like, why did you nail Hebrews, bro? You know, this, this is rad. You know, and like B.F. Bruce, you know, hey, pretty darn good one in Romans here, buddy. Newell did a good one in Romans, too. And it's just like these different commentaries that are out there, they help us as we're studying the word. But I would encourage you guys, study it first for yourself and then get a hold of a good commentary. One that's blessed my heart over the years more than any other has been, I don't even know where it is. Oh, here it is. John Corson. He's still alive. I normally read Dead Dudes. Um, but what I love about John's, they actually refer to it as the application commentary. Like, I love, and you guys know this from hearing me preach, what do we do as a result of God's word? And I think I learned a lot of that just from reading. I went through over 1,500 Bible studies through the Bible with John Corson. I felt like I did Bible college all over again just going through these commentaries. And I want to encourage you guys, take in the word of God, get some guys that you trust. I like Warren Wiersbe. He's another trusted guy. There's a lot of bad ones out there, but I can tell you, even the ones I enjoy, I don't agree with them all. Like, I got a Warren Wiersbe study Bible here. It's cool. It's got little, you know, highlights. It's not exhaustive because he wrote at length uh, different um, commentary, but it's cool having a good study Bible with good notes. But the guys that I really enjoy, I haven't found one guy I agree with 100%, and you're not going to. But they are good helps in that way. On your uh, handouts, I have a couple studies online. Enduring Word, David Guzik, uh, he has the entire Bible laid out. He quotes Spurgeon a lot and Clark, um, Newell, Henry, a bunch of different guys. And that's one thing I love about his commentary because he's actually commenting on other commentaries. And uh, it's a neat resource. Blue Letter Bible, how many of you guys have used that before? Yeah, isn't that so cool? You just click as you're reading through. It's like, oh, what does that mean in the Hebrew? And you just have to click on the word, and it'll bring up the Strong's definition of what it is. It is such a cool thing. They have so many helps in there. They even have a free institute if you want to take in-depth courses on Blue Letter Bible. Super good. It's all free. I like Bible Gateway, too. How many of you guys like reading different translations when you study? I love pulling that up because I can have like three or four different of my favorite translations and just look at them and compare and like, hey, why does this translation say it so differently? I want to pay attention and look into that. 
Um, Studylight.org is another good one. But anything that's going to get you guys into the Word of God, any tools that can help. Uh, something I've been doing with the kids for years, just on the way to school, 15-minute drive. Um, we just listen to audio Bible. You guys ever do that? I just downloaded an app, um, trial right now, two weeks. It's called Dwell. It's so cool. You can pick all these different translations in different uh, accents. Like I'm listening to a British dude right now, <laughs> his accent. And then you can pick background. They have like white noise or waterfalls. I like the ambient noise in the background. But it's so cool. I'm cruising around in my car and just being showered with the word of God. And I'm like, this is so cool. You know, so any, any opportunity you guys can get just to be in the word, do it. All right, one last scripture I want to look at with you guys before we open up our discussion time. Uh-oh, back to Psalm 112, verses 1 through 3. It says here, praise the Lord. Do you guys know how important it is to praise the Lord, guys? It puts everything into perspective. Last week I encouraged you guys before your prayer time, pray in and thank God for his awesomeness just how magnificent he is. Praise him in your prayer. And that's the same thing in our life. Some of us struggle with anxieties and depression. You know what the key is to depression, guys? Anyone want to guess? Praise the Lord, okay? Look to him. Get your eyes off yourself. Get your eyes on him. And then it says blessed. Do you guys know the word blessed in the Bible? It means happy, okay? Happy is the man who what? Fears the Lord. You want to be blessed in life? Learn to fear the Lord rightly. And what does it tell us here? Who delights greatly in what? His commandments. That's the word, guys. It's the word of God. Delight in the word of God. And how do we do that? Greatly, greatly delight. Personal Bible study shouldn't be a drag. It should be a delight. Like, whoa, this is good, God. Okay. Yeah, Leviticus gets a little boring, but even Leviticus, you can delight in. If you really slow down and take the time, there is some really cool stuff about who God is and why sacrifice is so important. So as a result, if we do this, guys, if we're actually fearing God here, okay, and delighting greatly in his commandments, if we do that, what's going to happen? Well, we're told here, that his descendants will be mighty on the earth. That generation, okay, is going to be upright. They're going to be blessed also. Don't you want that for our kids? I'm looking at this next generation, guys, and my heart's breaking. We're in rebellion to God. We have a world that is hopeless, that is full of problems, and we have the solution. We have the hope to share. We want to be hope dealers. We want to be able to share the goodness of God. And he also tells us in verse 3 here that wealth and riches will be in his house and his righteousness endures forever. God wants us to be successful. He wants us to prosper. And there's just something good about doing things his way. And we have to know his word. We got to get it. We got to fear him and greatly rejoice in his commands, and there's a lot of blessings to be had. So, one last quote by Charles Spurgeon, a Bible that's falling apart usually belongs to someone who isn't. I like that one. I like that one. And it's true, guys. It's true. Get into the word of God. All right, our homework it's going to be reading Joshua chapter 1, verses 1 through 9. And I want you guys to record only observations. So on the sheet, I want you to write down and ask yourself questions like who, what, when, where, how. Retell the event. Find the relationship between the characters in the passage. Try to figure out the emotions that are going on. What are you observing there? Okay, if you put yourself in that situation, in their shoes, what would that look like? What would you see? What would you feel? What would you think? You guys get observation, and that's what we're going to look at next week as we start inductive Bible study. And 
We're going to memorize 2 Timothy 3.16. We did 2 Timothy 2.15, or 2 Timothy 2.15, but now we're going to do 3.16. And why are we going to memorize the word of God? Because we're going to hide in our heart that we might not sin against you. It is good to memorize scripture. And if you guys stick with it, by the time we're done with our course, you're going to have close to 50 verses memorized. Is that pretty cool? Can I ask how many of you guys have 50 memory or verses memorized right now? Raise your hand. Is a verse every two weeks possible, doable? Absolutely, guys. Let's hide the word of God in our hearts. So next week, we will start inductive Bible study. I'm very much looking forward to that. So I want to open up our discussion time by asking the question, how have you experienced God's word personally? I'm going to have Finn run around. Lord willing, this will work now. If you want to throw up your hand, if anybody wants to share a testimony about how God's word touched their lives, benefited them. If any of you guys who are joining in remotely online, uh, just give me a wave and I will call on you. Um, and then you can answer at that time. So does anybody have a testimony that they would like to share on how the Word of God impacted them? All right, brother. This is Brother Bruce for you guys who are online. Strangely enough, I had a situation where um, I have a t-shirt of it that he prescribed me to come and set the captives free. There's a long backstory to that, but we don't have that much time. (laughs) But the Lord set me free as, as a... Well, one of the things he came to set free was me from me. <laughs> so that's what the word of God will do. Yeah. Set the prisoner free. Yep. Anyone else? All right, Sister Chris. This is kind of, it was actually a hymn, and it had the 23rd Psalm in it. We were learning it when I was in kindergarten, so I was either four or five years old. And our teacher was talking about Jesus being our good shepherd. And she was describing him in such wonderful words, and I just knew that I was loved, and I had never felt that before in my life, such a deep love that she described, a little kindergarten teacher, and um, something jumped in my heart, and all my life I didn't know what it was until I went to another church, and they were talking about being born again, and they were like, you know, talking about when God first comes into, or the Holy Spirit comes into your heart. And it just dawned on me that as a little child in kindergarten, my teacher through the word of God, it, it changed my heart at that time already. And I didn't realize, you know, how really, what a big deal that was. But it truly is. He's so good. Praise the Lord. I love how often, like, the word will speak into a specific situation or questions that I have currently. Like, it happens sometimes daily. I mean, you know, like our Thursday morning Bible study, it's almost weekly that I'm wrestling with something or God, like this morning, you know, like I actually, this was tonight, this was my third different study for tonight. It, we, we, we went in many different directions, but coming around the fear of God, I felt like that was a word from the Lord. And then this morning, God just confirmed that just through the reading of his word today. I'm just like, yeah. And that happens on a you know a regular basis, and I think that's why daily Bible study is so good, and it's not coincidence, okay? Yeah, if that just happened once in a while, maybe, 
but it happens all the time. Those things can't line up. It's just crazy. All right, any others? All right. Going to Sunny, who's one of my favorites. <laughs> um, so I think that's a tough question just because it, in, like you were saying, it impacts us daily. Mm-hmm. And I can think of a bunch of examples where God used it to speak something specific to transform my heart from thinking one way to another way to freeing me from anxiety. Um, but one of the stories in the Bible that encourages my heart when I'm reading God's word and I it feels dry when I feel like it's not speaking to me or maybe I'm in Leviticus or <laughs> like one of those fun books. Um, but just the story, I think it's in Kings or Chronicles when um, the Israelites um, were fighting against one of their enemies and they had run out of water and God told them to dig trenches. And I believe this story actually came from John Corson's application commentary. So I encourage those of you who haven't used it, you should read it. Um, but just thinking about the dryness of digging those ditches and feeling like, why are we digging ditches? I'm thirsty, I'm dry. Um, but then God filled those and gave them the water that they needed. So sometimes it's just digging in, even when you feel dry, and trusting that God's going to fill. So. Cool. Thank you. But it's one of those things, guys, is so good to allow the word of God to be speaking on a regular basis, because there's going to be things in life where we have big questions, or we may be in a crisis or a circumstance that just seems overwhelming. And there's just something that God does, because his word is spirit. It is supernatural. And it does things in us who are spiritually born again and alive that will do a work in our life that can't be explained. And it's far beyond anything that this world could offer or do in those situations. But I really want to encourage you guys, allow the word of God to work. Again, first, or sorry, James one twenty two, be hearers of God's word, okay, um, but also be doers of it. The scripture right before it, verse twenty one, tells us this: therefore, lay aside all filthiness and overflow of wickedness. Guys, we're always consuming something. We can be consuming junk, <laughs> but if we say no to it, like God tells us to do it, and then He goes on to say and receive with meekness the implanted word which saves your soul. Guys, so much of what we consume in this life, there's good things, but most things, they're just ruining us. They're killing us. They're ripping us off. And that's why God says, hey, stop consuming that. <laughs> receive my word, my implanted word. It's going to save you. And there's so many people that are just a wreck. They're being tossed to and fro. This world is getting the best of them, and that's not what God has. He wants to set us free. He has truth that will do that. So I encourage you guys, allow God's word to do that great work in our lives. All right. Um, Any questions that you guys have? We're going to be covering a lot of ground in the next few lessons when it comes to Bible study specifically, but I really want to encourage you guys, personal Bible study is where it's at. Okay, and if you guys aren't doing it, start doing it. If you need more tips, uh, grab a brother or sister, talk to me, somebody. I know uh, many of you guys personally, you share with me all the time uh, things that you're learning, scripture. I know that you're studying. Just pick each other's brains. Like, hey, how do you study? You know, what are some tips you have? What are you learning? I think one of the biggest things that we can do when it comes to uh, the body of Christ and doing life together is sharing what we're learning. Don't keep it to yourself. Pass it along. There's good things. And there's a privilege that God's given us and entrusted us with his word. So I want you guys to be uh, be bold with it. Share with people, even unbelievers, because people care about us. Hey, how you doing? What you been up to? You know what? Been learning some really cool stuff. Been studying the Bible. And God's teaching me this. It's that simple. And just share with them. What are they going to do with that? You know, 
maybe they'll actually start caring and start reading themselves. Who knows? Does that sound good? Awesome. Praise God. Yeah, Finn. Are, are we going to do any studies on discipling other people? Yes. <laughs> and that is the hope. That's a good question. Because the hope is, as we're going through this, like last time we took a lot in on prayer. And it's been so cool. I have had many of you, not just a few, many of you went to town and actually read your books. Some of you guys jumped on Ian Bounds and were just blown away by that. Some of you guys, several of you took on Andrew Murray's book and already read it. And you're being blessed. You're being stirred up in it. Even Larry told me this morning, I don't read books, but I read that. It was so good. <laughs> you know? He reads the Bible every day. But he's not a reader. But there's blessings and there are things. And I want to encourage you guys as we're learning here, and that's why I want you to take two sheets, pass it on, work with them. And the reality of discipleship, everything that we're going to be doing over the next two years is going to come around disciple-making. And two of the things we've just covered, prayer and the word, that is foundational to our walks with Jesus, truly being discipled and discipled well. So it will be two areas that we revisit quite a bit in studying the word of God. It is something as we just memorize 2 Timothy 2.15, study to show yourselves approved to God, a workman that doesn't need to be ashamed, work needs to be done, rightly dividing the word and again guys we want to get god's word right we don't want to misrepresent him god speaks very clearly what he says is what he means and what he means is what he says and this is what we want to do and that's what god has told us go into all the world and make disciples and how do we do that teaching them all that i have commanded all of it so we're going to be doing a lot on discipleship cool Let's stand to our feet. We're going to sing together, and you guys will be dismissed when we're done singing. Lord, prepare me to be a sanctuary. Tried and true.